Muy buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos a esta última plenaria del decimoquinto Congreso Nacional del Congreso de la Sociedad Matemática Mexicana. Eh, ¿eh? Ay, sí, quincuagésimo. Bueno, el 50 con un cerito Congreso de la Sociedad. Gracias, Javier. Gracias, maestro. Bueno, este, es para mí un honor enorme y un gran placer presentar a la última conferencista plenaria, que es la doctora Ángela Pistoia. Ángela trabaja en la Universidad de Roma, La Sapienza, y es experta en ecuaciones diferenciales parciales no lineales. Ángela es italiana, nació en la Toscana, y estudió tanto la licenciatura como el doctorado en la Universidad de Pisa. Y poco después de que terminó el doctorado, le ofrecieron una chamba en Roma, entonces fue a trabajar a Roma y allí en ecuaciones diferenciales parciales no lineales, particularmente usando métodos variacionales y métodos de reducción finita. Además, trabaja en problemas de análisis geométrico como el que nos va a platicar hoy, que se refiere al problema de Yamabe. Eh, Ángela es una persona que eh, pues es de las, de las eh, personas más destacadas en esta área. Ella tiene eh, a la fecha 130 artículos publicados con alrededor de 1.300 citas, eh, pero además es una persona muy creativa y muy generosa. Eh, yo creo que casi todos los que trabajamos en esta área Hemos trabajado con Ángela porque trabaja con todo el mundo. Y de veras es un grandísimo placer trabajar con ella. Es eh, de veras una persona creativa, generosa y particularmente con los jóvenes. Ella ha trabajado, por ejemplo, ha recibido en Roma a mis estudiantes de doctorado y siempre regresan de allá muy motivados y muy entusiasmados. Eh, déjenme decirles también que como persona es una persona estupenda, tiene una familia preciosa, su marido, Máximo Grossi, también es un matemático muy destacado. Tiene dos hijos guapísimos y es una mamá estupenda. Eh, se interesa también mucho por las cuestiones de género. Entonces, ha sido promotora de eh, la, la igualdad de género y ha sido vicepresidente de la Asociación de Mujeres Europeas en Matemáticas. Ya no les digo más, dejo a Ángela con ustedes. Gracias, Emilia Ángela. Okay. okay. Let me thank Monica for this wonderful open opening. I, I'm sorry because my English is not good. My Spanish is zero at all. But <laughs> I am very, very honored to be here. And uh, it is a pleasure for me to be in this wonderful Um, campus in Italy, we don't have a campus like this. I have to be honest. This is fantastic. <laughs> And also the atmosphere is very good. I, I, I usually spend one week, at least one week every day to work uh, with Monica in this wonderful place. So thank you. Thank you to, for this. I am commossa. I don't know how to say in, in, in Spanish commossa, but... Como vida. Okay, I'm como vida. Okay, let's, let's talk about mathematics, okay? <laughs> okay, so I will speak about uh, this topic and uh, I, I will talk about... Uh, let me introduce the problem using a very important problem, which is famous, is the Poincaré conjecture, okay? The starting point of my talk is the Poincaré conjecture. And um, before Poincaré conjecture uh, is conjecture, there was a, um, this uh, uniformization theorem which says that uh, every simply connected closed surface is homeomorphic to the two spheres. Okay? So if I have a surface, and the surface is such that any path can be, um, uh, can be deformed to a point, then this surface is a true sphere. This conjecture was uh, proved, completely proved, by Poincaré and Kerb at the beginning of the last century. Okay? One of the ingredients of the proof was that uh, uh, any, any metric, 
any any metric is it, is it always possible to find a metric which is conformal equivalent to the one I, I have on the surface for which the uh, Gaussian curvature is constant okay this was done at the beginning of the last century after this uh, um, theorem was proved Poincaré says that the same is true for the three-dimensional manifolds more precisely what it is said was the following. Every simply connected closed three-manifold is homomorphic to a three-sphere. Okay, this conjecture was proved a few years ago by Grigory Perelman in three papers, which are not published, but they are free in archive. Okay, so the, the conjecture now is completely solved. But before Grigory Perelman solved the conjecture, Yamabe, in, in 1960, tried to prove the conjecture. And he wanted to follow the same idea, follow it when we, he, he, people study the uniformization theorem. So what he wanted to prove was the following. That if I have a closed M Riemannian manifold uh, without uh, a compact M Riemannian manifold without boundary, then it is always possible to find a metric which is conformally equivalent to the one I have on the manifold for which the scalar curvature is constant. The scalar curvature in higher dimension, in two dimension, is the same of the Gaussian curvature. So this was his project, and they claimed and they proved this fact. But eight years later, Trudinger found a gap in the proof. The proof was not correct, and so this gives rise to one of the most important problems in the linear analysis of manifold, the so-called Yamabe problem. What is the Yamabe problem? The Yamabe problem is the following. Let us take a manifold without boundary, compact manifold. Is it possible to find a metric conformally equivalent to the one I have on the manifold for which the scalar curvature is constant? This is the Yamabe problem. And uh, this is, in my opinion, this is very beautiful because uh, this, geomet this purely geometric problem can be reformulated into a partial differential equation setting. So solving, finding the, a, a metric is equivalent in some sense to finding a solution to an equation. Let me tell you how we can do this, okay? Okay, before to give you the equation, I need to introduce some stuff, some geometric stuff, some curvature tensors, okay? So what I do, I take this compact Riemannian manifold and I introduce the curvature tensor, which is given by this, uh, for this green formula. The, oh, sorry. This formula here. This is a fourth tensor, okay? If I take the trace of this tensor and I contract two indices in this way, what I get is the Ricci curvature tensor. Okay, this is a two tensor. Then what I do, I take the trace of this Ricci curvature tensor and what again I, I get is the scalar curvature. Okay, if m is equal to, the scalar curvature is nothing but the Gaussian curvature. Okay, twice the Gaussian curvature. And uh, it is important to point out that from the round, for the round sphere, I mean the sphere with the usual, the, the, the standard metric, then the, the Ricci tensor, oh, the Ricci tensor here is the multiple of the, of the metric and the, uh, the scalar curvature is a constant, is M, times n minus 1, where m is the dimension of the manifold, of the sphere. Okay, this, uh, this is one ingredient, and now let me give you the PD formulation. So I have this metric G, I take the conformal class of the metric, this guy here, sorry, but I have some problem with the... Okay, this is, I cannot see very well, sorry. I, I cannot use this guy. Okay, so the conformal class of G is a positive multiple of the metric G. The metric is positive. I take the metric, multiply by phi, I get another metric. 
This is a conformal class because this guy here preserves the angles. Okay? This is important. And now what I do, I take a, a, a conformal metric, which I write like G tilde, equal to U to the power 4 over M minus 2 times G. I write the conformal factor in this strange way, U to the capital 4 over minus 2. U is a positive function, okay? This is a conformal factor, and what I do, I compute the scalar curvature of this new metric in terms of the scalar curvature of the, 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 the initial metric G and in terms of the conformal factor U. And what I get, I get this uh, green relation, you see that. Uh, in the bracket, I have an operator, which is a, an elliptic operator. Delta G is the Laplace operator, the Laplace Beltrami operator associated with the metric, the Laplacian. If I have in the Euclidean case, this is nothing but the Laplacian. And uh, the minus something which is linear with a coefficient, which is uh, this guy, which depends on RG. And this is uh, the, the quantity into the bracket is the conformal Laplacian. This is conformal because if I change the metric, they, they change, it changes in a good way. Okay? This is what uh, I have. And now you see that if I, the, the other problem says the following. I want to change the metric in the conformal way so that the, the, the scalar curvature related to the new metric is constant. So you see that... Uh, Rg tilde is constant, means that uh, I put this guy on the other side, I can solve this problem. So you see that if I want to, if I'm looking for a metric where scalar curvature is constant, what I do is the following. I look for a strictly positive solution to this equation on the manifold. Okay? So now, in order to solve the Yamada problem, I will look for positive solution to this partial differential equation on the manifold. Lg is like the Laplacian, okay? It's a second order elliptic operator. So, now let me tell you, so we have an equation. How can we solve this equation? We can use the variational structure of the problem. I mean, there is a, an energy, this pink energy on the, you see here, which is on the, uh, on, on the numerator, we have this, uh, uh, this integral, which depends on the gradient. It, the, the derivative of the upper side, let me say, is the conformal Laplacian, in some sense. Uh, the, dom the denominator there is um, the nonlinearity on the left-hand side. Okay. So we have this energy, critical points of this energy are a solution to the problem, but it is important to introduce the quotient, which is the infimum of J on the space H1G. This, the, the, this function, this energy, acts on this space H1G, which is a Sobolev space. It contains the function whose derivatives are exist more or less. What I do, I take the infimum of J on this space, and it is clear that uh, because of the Sobolev embedding of H1 into LP, this, uh, this embedding is continuous on the infimum exists, but now the exponent 2m over m minus 2 is the critical exponent because the embedding is continuous, but it is not compact. So the infimum cannot be achieved. Okay, that's the problem, because I don't have the compactness. So the infimum cannot be a minimum. And that's a problem, because if the Yamabe quotient is achieved, the minimum is a solution to the question, so I get the solution to the Yamabe problem. Okay, this is uh, the story. So, what I want to do is to find a critical problem and to find um, a, 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 critical point, a critical point of J. What I want to do is to prove that the Yamabe quotient is achieved. So it is a minimum. This is the point. And this simple question is extremely difficult to, 
to answer because let us see what happens. Let us consider the standard case, which is the, the case of the sphere, the Euclidean sphere. Okay, let me say in this way. Let us consider the, 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 the round sphere. And in that case, the Yamabe quotient is achieved. But unfortunately, it is achieved by too many functions. Indeed, what I can prove is the following. Let, let me write the equation on the sphere, which is uh, the first line there. I, this is the first equation on the sphere. I want to read the equation on the sphere on the Euclidean space. I use the stereographic projection, which is a, a conformal transformation. And what I get is this famous equation in the Euclidean space. This equation in the Euclidean space has infinitely many solutions because First of all, if you have a solution and you translate, you get another solution. So there is an invariance by translating, by translation. But there is also another invariance, which is due to the dilation here, you see. So the problem has infinitely many solutions, which are called standard bubbles. These are important because they are the main, in, the main ingredients in solving the Yamabe problem and also in this talk. Which is the shape of these bubbles? These are the following. There is this blue function here, which is radially symmetric. It achieves the maximum at the origin. And then what you get is the following. You translate the maximum at another point, and then you make a dilation. As this parameter delta is going to zero, the solution is going to zero everywhere, except at the point y, where it achieves the maximum and at the maximum it goes to plus infinity. So the bubbles look like this way. The bubbles is going to zero everywhere except at the maximum point where it blows up at, at the plus infinity. Okay, this is the, 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 the picture. Okay, this is the bubble in the Euclidean space and if you come back to the sphere using the stereographic projection, you get something like this. Okay. So, the Yamabe quotient on the sphere is achieved, but there are too many functions which achieves. And that's a problem, because uh, 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 if I want, to, I want to solve the Yamabe problem, I have to be sure that uh, I cannot find so many solutions, because other, otherwise there is a lack of compactness. I cannot uh, deal with this infimum. And indeed, what uh, Oben in '76 proved was this wonderful result. He says that if the Imabe quotient is strictly less than the quotient on the sphere, then the Yamabe quotient is achieved and the Yamabe problem is solved. Okay, so to solve the Yamabe problem, it is sufficient to find the test function was energy is below to this guy, to the Yamabe quotient on the sphere. That's the point, to find a good function. And uh, finding a good function took a lot of time, at least 20 years, more or less. Uh, let me tell you why. Okay, le there are three cases. One is the, the green case here, when the Yamabe quotient is less or equal than zero. This is, let me say, easier. It was solved by Schrodinger and Doben many years ago. It was the first result. The second result is when the, the Yamabe quotient is positive, but the manifold is not locally conformally flat, and the dimension of the manifold is greater or equal than six. Not locally conformally, a manifold which is locally conformally flat it looks like very close to the point, it's conformally equivalent to the Euclidean space, that's the idea, to, to the sphere, okay? And finally, uh, uh, the, the most difficult case when, is when the, the Yamabe quotient is positive and the manifold is locally conformally flat and the, all the dimension is uh, 3, 4, 5. And uh, it, take, it took a lot of time because, uh, you, as you see here, it was solved in 84 under an assumption which involves the positive mass theorem, and uh, I will be back to this problem in, in a few minutes, or in a, in a different way by, by using the critical points at infinity. Okay, here you see the people who, who gave 
the most important mm, uh, part, the proof of the most important part. Okay, so let me tell you how to build this test function. Because it will be useful for, to, to describe what I, I did with some of my collaborators. Okay, but in any case, it, let me tell you. First of all, the wild tensor. Let me introduce the wild tensor. The wild tensor is, is, uh, looks like a mess because you see this is a tensor, which is the trace free part of the Riemann tensor. The definition is, uh, is terrible. And also, the, the, it involves, uh, you see, the Riemann tensor, this is the Schouten tensor, so it's, it's, a, it's a mess. But if I, if I want to, to tell you what the wild tensor measures, I can tell you the following. The curvature tensors gives you some information uh, about uh, how much the volume of the balls is different from the, the volume of the Euclidean balls. This is what the curvature measures. The, the wild tensor gives you the, the information about how the shape of the manifold is different when, uh, from the Euclidean setting, let me, let me tell you in this way. But what it is important is that uh, the wild tensor is conformally invariant. I mean, if I change the metric of the manifold in the conformal way, the scalar curvature changes, but the wall tensor, no. So this is very intrinsic of the problem. And let me also tell you that if m, m is equal 3, the wall tensor identically vanishes, so it doesn't, care, it doesn't carry any information. But if m is greater or equal than 4, the wall curvature tensor vanishes if and only if the manifold is locally conformally flat. Okay, this is uh, the what happens. And the second, in so one ingredient in order to solve the Yamabe problem is the wall tensor. The second ingredient is the Green's function. The Green's function is, is, uh, can be defined in, the, in this way. I have this conformal Laplacian. Assume that it is positive. Think about the Laplacian, okay? Okay, the, the, if I want to solve the problem, minus, oh, minus Lg minus conformal Laplacian equal to a Dirac delta at a point C0 on the manifold, then what I get is a green function, the so-called green function. Okay? And uh, what it is possible to prove, Lee and Parker proved the following fact, if I am in low dimension, 3, 4, 5, or the manifold is locally conformally flat, I can write the Green's function around the point xa naught like a singular part, which is this one. It, it blows up x the, as the point x goes to the point xa naught, plus this red term. This red term plays a crucial role in the studying of uh, Yamabe problem. This uh, m xa naught is called the, the mass of the operator. And uh, this is smooth, this is a smooth function. And uh, it, is, it, it was supposed to be po strictly positive. This is the famous positive mass conjecture, which was proved uh, in low dimension by Liam Parker, Schoen, Yao, and Witten. It was also proved by, in the case of a locally, in the locally conformally flat case, but only this here, or the last here, it was proved in the general situation by Lockham. So the positive mass is strictly positive. And now we are ready to solve the, the, the Yamabe problem because uh, you see, remember that to solve the Yamabe problem, I need to find the test function whose energy is less than the energy, the, um, the Yamabe quotient on the sphere. And what I take is the bubble. You see, I take the bubble. This is the Euclidean bubble. I read the bubble on the, on the manifold. This is the tangent space. Okay, I make this, uh, so I take the bubble in our M. I read the bubble on the tangent plane at the manifold, and I compute the, the energy. Now, this is too rough. Huh? The, the, the good test and function is more elaborated, more or less, this is the idea. And what I get is the following. You, 
I computed the energy, and the energy, I remember that the, my bubble is concentrating, so the delta parameter is going to zero. The first term of the energy is the, the, Yamabe, the, the Yamabe quotient of the sphere minus something. In the three cases, I have the, the mu zero, which is the bad level. I have to, to, to be be strictly below this bad level in order to get a solution. So you have this bad level minus something, the green guys here. And all these three guys are strictly negative. You see that when the dimension is low or when the wall tensor is zero, this is the, we have the mass. In the other case, we have to work with the wall tensor. Okay, this is more or less the idea. So the Yamabe, pro, uh, qu uh, the Yamabe problem was solved. And so the problem now, the second step is how many solutions does it have? So is it unique, the solution, or not? Okay, if the Yamabe quotient in the negative case, in the case of negative scalar curvature, the solution is unique. There is only one solution. If this is zero, if the Yamabe quotient is zero, the solution is unique up to translation, to up to a, sorry, up to a constant factor, and uh, the most difficult case, the, the most uh, interesting case, is when the Yamabe quotient is strictly positive. Indeed, in that case, the solution is not unique. Schoen and Pollack, when they built examples of a large, were a large examples of manifolds which are like tori, this way, for which there exists a large number of solutions, was Morse index goes to plus infinity, so as many solutions as we want. So it is natural to ask what, what, is the, what, what are the properties of the full set of solutions to the Yamabe problem. And in particular, Shen conjectured that the set of solutions is compact. This was the famous Shen conjecture. Uh, it is compact unless the manifold is the sphere, because in the sphere there are infinitely many solutions and the set of solutions is not compact because of this blowing up procedure. Okay, and uh, again, the geometric problem can be formulated into a PD framework, indeed uh, using the Arnak inequalities and the standard elliptic estimates, the compactness is equivalent to establish a priori estimates to the solution to the PDE. So, the, the set of metric is compact, this in, the, in the positive case, I can assume that the scalar curvature is one, is compact, if and only if the set of solution to the PDE is a compact set. So, there are no blowing up solutions for, for this equation. Compact means that I cannot find solution was L infinity norm is going to plus infinity. So this is the, the problem. This was uh, conjectured by Shen, and the results are the following. The Yamabe quotient is compact when the dimension is between 3 and 24. There is this number, strange number 24. But this is uh, sharp because uh, Brendel and Brendel and Marcus proved then when the dimension is greater than 25, the problem is not compact anymore. Indeed, what they did was, was the following. They took the spheres, the sphere, and they built a metric on the sphere, which is not locally conformally flat, for which the problem has a family of solutions which blows up at one point in, uh, on the sphere. This is what they did. Okay, these are the final step, you see, the conjecture was of, it was a Shen conjecture, um, the claim in 1984, in 1988, and it took about 20 years to prove the conjecture. It was very hard, and there are many results in between. Okay, but finally, it is completed. And uh, which is the ingredient of the proof? The ingredient of the, of the proof of the compactness relies on proving, on proving sharp pointwise estimates at the, at the blow-up point of the solution. The problem is not compact. It means that there is a family of solutions which blows up at one point. 
What does it mean that uh, it blows up at one point? There is a point of the manifold for which the, the solution... Okay, let me tell you better. I say that uh, C0 is a blow-up point for the family of solution if uh, there is a, a point Xn where Un achieves the maximum, for which the maximum value goes to plus infinity, and the maximum point approaches the point Xi0. This is the definition of blow-up point. And uh, the compactness res result relies on the fact that uh, all the possible blow-up points are isolated and simple. What does it mean? It means that if I look at the solution close to the blow-up point, what I see is exactly the standard bubble, the Euclidean standard bubble. This is what uh, it, it can be proved, what the people proved. What is an isolated and simple blow-up point? Now, here I have a slide with the definition. They are too complicated. Let me give you uh, the picture because it is easier, in my opinion. So you see, in the last picture, you see C0, this red point, is a blow-up point. So the solution is going to plus infinity at that point. It's isolated and simple. It means that the solution looks like one bubble, only one bubble. The point is isolated, but not simple. What does it mean? It means that the solution has one maximum point, but if you look at the solution, you don't see a bubble, but you, look, you see a superposition of bubbles. You have one bubble, then above you have another bubble, like a tower. Like this is a towering lower point. It is isolated, it has a, a, a maximum, but uh, the problem is that uh, there are two bubbles. And finally, the lower point can be also not isolated. What does it mean? It means that uh, the solution close to the point looks like two bubbles which are collapsing to the same point. This is the clustering phenomenon. Well, this, the first two phenomena cannot happen in the, when the problem, when the Yamabe problem is compact. This is strictly forbidden. Only the third case can happen. Okay? This is uh, the story. So, existence of Yamabe problem is uh, clear. The compactness is clear. Now, what can we do to understand if the Yamabe problem is stable or not? What is uh, this stability property? Roughly speaking, is the following. I take the Yamabe equation, I shake the, the Yamabe equation, perturbing the Yamabe equation in some way. Do I produce, using this uh, shaking, solutions which blow up or not? Does it mean that do we create, if we slightly perturb the Yamabe equation, do we create solutions which stand far from a solution to the standard, to the initial EMAB equation. This is the problem. Okay, let me give you some uh, more precise definition. And I say that the EMAB equation is stable if, only, if for any sequence, for any H1 bounded sequence of the equation, here you see if epsilon is zero, this is nothing but the EMAB equation. So I perturb, I shake introducing this uh, linear perturbation. And the problem is stable if, uh, given this uh, sequence, there is a solution U0 such that U epsilon converges to U0. You see that uh, if the Yamabe problem is stable, the blow-up phenomena are strictly forbidden because, because uh, a, a solution which blows up at one or more point does not satisfy this equation because they blows up. Then the L infinity norm is going to plus infinity. And so the question one can ask is, is the Yamabe problem stable? And the answers are the following. When M is equal to three, the Yamabe problem is stable. This is proved by Lee and Zhu and Drue some years ago. And uh, when, the, when m is greater or equal than 4, the Yamabe equation is not stable. It's not stable because we can prove 
that there exists a family of solutions which blows up at one point of the manifold as epsilon goes to zero. Blowing up means that the solution is going to plus infinity. Okay, and uh, what it is interesting, uh, what I think it is interesting is that the blow up point are never isolated nor simple. If the dimension of the manifold is greater or equal than seven, and the manifold is not locally conformally flat. Indeed, we can build the solutions whose blow up point looks like a clustering, and solutions whose blow up point looks like a tower. Okay, so cluster means bubbles which accumulated, towers means one bubble over the other. And that's interesting because in the Euclidean case, this is strictly forbidden. All the blow-up points are isolated and simple. So the geometry uh, gives you a richness in the existence of solutions. This is the point. The Euclidean uh, space is too poor. In order to find a solution, you have to work with manifolds with rich uh, geometry. This is more or less the idea. Okay, let me give you... The, uh, the right statement and the rest, uh, the right statements, uh, they look like this one. Okay, assume, I, how much, I, at 6.30 I have to finish? See, I think so. Oh, maybe, see, okay. So, let me give you the, the statement of the results. Assume that, uh, uh, you do, you rem do you, rem you, you remember that if I want to solve the Yamabe problem, I have to, to, to make a difference between the case of low dimension, the case of the locally conformally flat case, and the case of not locally conformally. So, in the same spirit, there are two different situations. The situation where the wild tensor plays a role, and the situation where the mass of the manifold plays a role. Okay? And in both cases, if I have a critical point, a good critical point of the wild tensor or a good critical point of the mass, I can find a solution which blows up at that point. Okay? This is the, the statement. And moreover, if this point is good, I mean, let us consider the case where the manifold is not locally conformally flat and the dimension is greater or equal than seven, then I know that the critical points of the wild tensors gives you solutions which blows up at that point. Well, if that point is good, I mean, for example, it is a non-degenerate minimum point, what I can find that this blow-up point is a clustering blow-up point. What does it mean? You see in the picture, I can build as many solutions as you want. Was peaks, was blowing up point, collapse to the same point. This is a cluster phenomena. And uh, moreover, if the, the manifold is symmetric with respect to the, to the point x, x naught, where the wild tensor is different from zero, then X0 is also a towering point. What does it mean? It means that I can build a solution with as many peaks as you want, which looks like a superposition of bubbles. Okay, this is what uh, it can be done. And the picture, you see, you see the picture of the, of the towering. Okay, now the results are finished. Let me make some remarks on the assumption because they are interesting. One can say, okay, but do there exist manifolds for which this kind of assumption are two or, or are you cheating? No, okay. First of all, let us consider the case of the critical points of the, the norm of the wild tensor. The wild tensor is the four tensors. I take uh, the norm of this four tensor, make the square. I take a critical point of this function at a level different from zero. Well, it is possible to prove. I need a, a non-degenerate critical point of this guy. Okay, it is possible to prove that for most matrix G, the critical points are non-degenerate. It is like a Morse function, okay? And indeed, the per to prove this theorem, we use a Sartre's lemma, okay? Something like this, transversality argument. 
So, okay, the set of metrics for which, this, um, for which the wild tensor is a Morse function is not, a, is not empty. And moreover, I also need a, a, a manifold for which the, wild, the minimum of the wild tensor is not zero. And uh, what I have to do is to take the product of around the sphere. The sphere is such that the wild tensor is zero because the sphere is locally conformally flat. But the product of sphere is not. Uh, and the wild tensor is different from zero at any point. Okay, the second group of assumption concerning uh, concern the case of symmetric manifolds. What is a symmetric manifold? Symmetric manifold is a, is a manifold such that you, you look at the, the tangent space Okay, the tangent, the tangent space is such, a, such that uh, there is an isometry on the manifold for which uh, the differential of the, the derivative of, the, uh, the, of this isometry uh, read on the tangent space is uh, minus the identity. The sphere is uh, symmetric with respect to any point. But the sphere is not good because the wall tensor vanishes, so what I have to take is the product of the spheres, the toro, the, to, the tori. The tori are such that uh, the wall tensor is different from zero at any point, and the tori are in, uh, symmetric with respect to any point. Okay, so our set of assumptions is, no, is not empty. And let me give you an idea of the proof, just an idea, because I, I, I would like to talk to you about uh, this Lyapunov-Schmidt procedure. This Leopold Schmidt procedure is very trendy, is very cool, because it allows to, to prove a, 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 a lot of things, in particular that the judge's conjecture was proved using this refinement, not this one, but the refinement of the Leopold Schmidt procedure. So let me give you just an idea of the proof, because this is very technical. What is the finite dimensional Leopold Schmidt reduction? It's the following. There are three steps to use the Lyapunov schmidt procedure. The first one, remember that I want to build the solution, I want to, to build by ends, okay? Yeah. And so what I do, first of all, is to find a good approximation. Since we are playing with the bubbles, the bubbles is more or less a good approximation. The second step is to reduce the problem to a finite dimensional one, because this is very roughly speaking, the solution you are looking for belongs to a space of functions. The space of functions is infinitely, has infinite dimension. So what I want to do is to reduce the dimension from infinity to what? n plus one, as you will see in one moment, <laughs> to a finite dimensional, to a finite dimensional space. And, fi and finally, once I have reduced the problem, I want to find the solution of the reduced problem. This is the, pro the procedure. It's very easy to say. Let me give you just a, a very sh a brief idea about the proof when the dimension of the manifold is greater or equal than 7 and the manifold is not locally conformally flat. Remember that in this case, the wall tensor plays a role. It, this is the case. Okay, first step, to look for an approximated solution. Okay, this is more or less clear. I played up to now with bubbles, so, so what, what I want to do is the following. I take the manifold. I take a point of the manifold. I don't choose the point. I take just one point. I take the tangent space at that point. The tangent space is a, a Euclidean space of dimension m. So this is like Rm. On Rm, I take the bubble. Okay? And via the exponential map and geodesic coordinate, I read the bubble on the manifold. This is what I do. The bubble. So as the maximum at the point C I have chosen on the manifold, and I am the, uh, concentrating the bubble, so there is also this parameter delta. Delta is going to zero, the bubble is concentrating. So the solution is this V epsilon, I build in this way. There is an epsilon in the question, remember. Plus this green term. This green term is the reminder term. This is a lower order term. Okay, this is my answer. More or less, you see from the construction that the one I want to find, sorry, is uh, delta concentration parameter 
point xi. So more or less we are done because uh, I have to find n plus one things, two things, one delta and one point on the manifold which belongs, which is like an RM. Okay. Uh, this is the approximation. Now we, let us see what, uh, how can we reduce the problem. First of all, in this, in usually this green guy here is the most difficult part. To find the error phi in terms of the delta and xi of the two parameters. And, uh, and another point, which is technical, but not, you can imagine that it is true, is that the uh, epsilon, which looks like the bubble plus this uh, lower order term, is a solution to my problem. If, namely, a critical point of the energy, the problem as a variational structure, so the solutions are critical point of something, if and only if the pair delta xi is a critical point of the reduced energy. The phi, the lower order term, depends on these two points, delta xi. And so, it is clear that if I want a solution, I have to find the critical point of this i tilde. Okay? So, first step, the last step, is to look at the reduced problem. I have to compute the reduced energy because I have to find the critical point of this guy. And uh, I made the compute, we can make the computation. What we see is that the reduced energy looks like mu zero. Mu zero is the Yamabe quotient on the sphere, okay? Plus something, which is this blue part, which contains the concentration parameter delta and the wild tensor, plus higher order term. So, in order to find the critical point of this guy, what I have to do is to find the critical point of delta, which is the main part of the expansion. You see, sorry, this is the part which comes from Yamabe. And there is this epsilon part which comes from the, the perturbation. And finally, you see that this reduces energy as a critical point because the, the, the blue function as a, a maximum. As a maximum, because for example, I take xi zero, minimum point of the wild tensor with the level different from zero, then I maximize in psi and I minimize in delta. And what I get is a critical point of phi. Then, since I tilde is very close to, uh, sorry, I, can, I find a critical point. Hmm? I find the critical point of F. Now, I tilde is very close to F. What I get is the critical point of A tilde. And that's all. Oh, this is very concentrate of the Lyapunov Schmidt procedure. So, let me thank you. Muchas gracias. Okay, so are there questions? So I, I have two questions. When you mention the stability property, it seems more natural to move the uh, conformal class of the metric. So in the space of all metrics in the manifold, you have the ones which are conformally equivalent to each one, and so you have like some kind of vibration. And it seems natural, instead of continuing this perturbation that you made, one could think of making a general perturbation of the conformal class. Yes. That's one question. So, and the other question would be, <clears throat> uh, it seems that the emphasis is on the bubbles and not on the homology of the manifold. It, they don't enter. So in some sense, uh, uh, is this related to, to the injectivity radius in the sense that if the homology of the manifold is sufficiently small, perhaps it might get mixed with the bubbles. Ah. I don't see why the bubbles, if, if the homology of the manifold is very small, it might get mixed up with the bubbles and then produce some problem, but it seems from your exposition that that doesn't happen, so I wonder why. I uh, know, you're right. 
both the questions are, are, are very interesting. The first question, I have to be honest, we thought about that. But uh, we were not able to see how the Laplace Beltrami operator depends on the perturbation of the metric. Maybe there are a lot of com computation to do, that's the problem. Because you, you are thinking to a G, you perturb G like G plus epsilon H, and you need to see how the equation becomes. So maybe something can be done, we, we thought about that. And the second question is too difficult, I mean, we never, because I'm not an expert uh, of, of homology. I think that you are right, something can be done. But we ne I, I never thought about that, because my geometry is a poor geometry, so <laughs> sorry. Any other question? I guess the question is related to the previous one, in the sense that uh, is it possible to, to obtain in terms of the topology, let's say the homology of the manifold uh, bounds for, for the clustering phenomena, or, or how, how bad that is? Okay, the, the construction I, I perform is a local, very local. I don't see the whole geometry. If I would like to see the whole geometry, I would use something different. But in the sense, I mean, might be related to Barry and Coron's old result. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Barry tried to prove the um, the Yamabe to find the solution of the Yamabe problem following that point of view. He used the, the the homology of the manifold. Here, the the, the point of view is very local. Okay. It's very local. Even in the in this in the solution found by Shen, you see. You need to prove that uh, your Yamabe quotient is strictly below to the Yamabe quotient on the sphere. And to prove that, you find a solution which is concentrating around the point. So it is very local. That's and if I may, uh, may ask one last question. Uh, have you thought about the parabolic problem, so the, the Yamabe flow? This is what I would like to do. Indeed, there is a, a, a colleague of mine in Roma, and we are trying to, to work on, on the Yamabe flow because uh, you see the first step, you, we, here we use uh, epsilon as a parameter. But in the Yamabe flow, there is this natural parameter, which is the time. Is time. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that Del Pino and Wei and, the, and their colleagues are, are working on that. On that. Because the idea more or less is more complicated, but the idea more or less is this one. Using the time to produce a solution. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Well, if not, uh, let us thank. Ah, no, 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 I have to do something just a moment. I have to give something to Angela. Le tengo que dar una cosita a Angela que me encargó la sociedad que le diera. Entonces, paciencia, chamacos. Angela, so on behalf of the, of the Mexican Mathematical Society, I want to thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And uh, this is uh, something you. that I... That thank I, you. That's they are, uh, giving you. A wonderful present. Okay, let, ju just uh, one word. L let me tell you that um, I was very emotionata to give this talk because I gave a lot of talk eh, around the world. But in my opinion, this is the, one of the most, the most imp I would say the most important one. So thank you very much for having, to, to be here, to inviting me. Thank you, thank you. Thank